Welcome back, everyone. Tuesday, July 19th. For some of you, already Wednesday. Welcome back to the Quantum Computing and Entrepreneurship Program. Today, we have two talks that are very close to my heart about cryogenic measurement systems and then superconducting quantum computers. I work with the dilution refrigerator myself, so I'm very much looking forward to the talk by Blue Force. And then Daniela Bogorin from IBM will tell what to actually do in such a dilution refrigerator. But before we start, I would like to do some shout outs to all of you as participants. You have been joining this Zoom every day since last week, consistently, very actively participating, and we all want to thank you for that. Today, starting with cryogenic measurement systems by Blue Force, we have Elina Potanina here. She has a PhD in nanoelectronics and quantum transport from Alto University. And then she joined the Blue Force sales and marketing team, where she helps customers implement the best cryogenic solutions for their measurements. And for that purpose, her own background in quantum dots and atomic transistor physics helps tremendously. Elina, we very much look forward to your talk. Please take it away. Thank you so much for this nice introduction, Marlo. Yes, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning, good evening. At the moment, we're in Finland. It's uh, 6 p.m. here, so good evening from our side. My name is Elena. I'm sales engineer in Blue Force. Today with me is my colleague, Vera. Vera is testing and installing systems for our customers. She's been working at Blue Force for over three years now. So it's my pleasure to tell you today about Blue Force cryogenic measurement systems, and we will focus on on how to actually get to such low temperatures as millikelvin temperatures. So this presentation is going to be a brief overview of Blue Force journey, a very quick product overview, and then the main focus will be how do we cool down from room temperature all the way to millikelvin. At the end of the presentation, which should be roughly 20 minutes, we will have a Q&A session where Vera will join me and we will be happy to answer your questions. So Blue Force journey actually started in 2008 when Peter and Rob founded the company. It's a spin-off from Alto University. Since then, the company grew from one person to 300 employee company. At the moment, we have over 300 employees of 40 different nationalities working at Blue Force. Last year, we have reached revenue over 100 million euros. Today, Blue Force is a market leader for cryogenic measurement systems. Our work is directed by three core values which are well-being, integrity, and quality. We balance time and energy productively, we reflect on what we do, and we can proudly stand for what we are doing. At the moment, we are in Helsinki, Finland, and that's where our headquarters are, but we also have subsidiaries in US and Germany, as well as Blue Force Lab in Delft, Netherlands. We also have sales and service representatives in India, China, and Japan. Here also in Helsinki, Finland, we have our factory. We have expanded and invested actively in our facilities, which are currently over 9,000 square meters. Our cryo hall has a capacity uh, of testing 40 systems. So where do we come from? On the left, you can see old, uh, let's say, cryogenic style system, so-called wet fridge. On the right, you can see a dry cryogen-free bridge. So in Blue Force, our aim was to make operation easy. So in other words, we come from difficult operation to an easy one push of a button automated operation. Just a quick product overview before we dive further into details. So originally we started with the SD system, which is our most compact and smallest system. But at the moment, the most popular and most sold systems are a larger diameter cryostats, such as LD system and XLD system. Here you can see a closer look on our XLD system with two dilution units. And it has recently been upgraded to have sideloading ports for quick replacement of wiring. We introduced the new form factor for sideloading measurement infrastructure, including high-density wiring which you can see here on the right side of the picture. We have introduced it to support large measurement setups and easy scalability. We also offer horizontal systems, 
such as LH system, which you can see next to the XLD system, which is basically a horizontal version of the LD system. It has the same specs and same flange diameter. And on the very right of the slide, you can see a cryogenic wafer probe, which is a system we developed together with our partner, Afore, specifically for silicon wafer probing at temperatures around 2 Kelvin. Finally, I would like to mention that before we go to, to millikelvins, although we have a big community of researchers working on superconducting qubits, it's not the only application for blue force fridges. We actually have customers using horizontal systems in astrophysics where they need to cool detectors inside large telescopes. You can see an example in these photos. There's also a material science community and super, superconducting materials often need temperatures way below one Kelvin. Quantum technologies in general is not about, it's not only about qubits. So applications include nanoelectronics, nanoelectronics, quantum communication experiments, etc. So finally, Yes, to the main focus of this talk, how do we get to something that's cold and what is actually, what is cold, colder, what do we use to compare, what is the scale? So first, I would like to remind our listeners, participants, that uh, some of you might be familiar, more familiar with Celsius, and some of you might be more familiar with Fahrenheit. Nevertheless, we are all familiar, familiar with the fridges, the regular fridges in our kitchen. Fridge is already a good reference point because we know that in the fridge we can keep our food cold and our drinks chilled. But then when we go to the freezer, everything containing water actually goes to the solid state and, and freezes. So that's a reference for cold and colder. Nevertheless, fridge is not the coldest space, not the coldest place on Earth. And um, officially, lowest temperature recorded in nature is minus 89 degrees Celsius. That's the record one. That's uh, that's a naturally occurring one on Earth. So if we go a little bit further away out in space, we will actually find a nice 2.7 Kelvin cooled down environment, which is uh, already pretty cold and might be good for some of the low temperature applications to be honest. But that's that's the coldest it can naturally get. Now, how can we artificially achieve something colder than that? So here uh, I would like to first introduce you to the components of the dilution refrigerator. On the top, you can see so-called room temperature flange, and uh, the names of the flanges speak uh, for themselves. And uh, below it, you can see 50K flange, 4K flange, still cold, and finally the mixing chamber flange where the lowest temperatures are achieved. Under mixing flange, um, mixing chamber flange, you can see this space. This is where customers mount their devices usually. So that's an experimental space. And all of these stages, they share the same vacuum. And on the outside, you can see these three sections. These shells are vacuum cans. And in this case, it's an XLD model with three section vacuum can. On the top, you can see pulse tubes. I would like to start with by discussing exactly Exactly what, what are they for and what do they do? We have room temperature. And first, let's discuss how do we get to 4 Kelvin. So this is the first pre-cooling cycle which occurs in the fridge. And uh, we use so-called pulse tube cryocoolers. And here you can see a cold head. And it is mounted inside the fridge and connected to the 50K and 4K flange. It's thermalized with the 4K flange with these copper braids, which you can see here and a little bit over here as well. So just a quick reminder on the basic Joel Thompson effect. Pulse tubes have compressors, which compress the helium, helium gas in this case. High pressure, high temperature helium is collected. And then we have a valve to regulate the flow of this high pressure gas. The next the important element of the pulse tube is the regenerator, which is basically a metallic mesh or a porous media through which the gas is pushed through and later allowed to freely expand in the pulse tube. And by expanding, it also cools down. And that's how we collect the cool, cool down helium in the pulse tube. So what do we use it for? We thermalize it via heat exchanger with our, in this case, 4K flange, and this and take away the heat by cooling the flange, essentially. It heats up helium, which then returns back to the pulse tube and stays here in the bottom, so it tends to stay here in the bottom. 
In order to continue the cycle, we have to forward the hot helium to another heat exchanger and then dump the heat to, to external source somewhere to cool it down a little bit before it proceeds back to the compressor. And then the cycle starts over again. Compress gas, let it expand, cools down. We use it to thermalize and cool down object or the space or the environment it's connected to. Dump the heat and cool as long as we get to the desired temperature. In this case, it's a little bit below 4 Kelvin. It's around 3.6 Kelvin. The next stage is if we want to cool down further, we add steel flange and we also add another cooling loop. We have a steel pumping line, we have condensing line, and we add helium-4 in this case, another working gas. We have to add pumps. We need to do work in order to achieve cooling, and we continue running on the same principle, essentially. The work done by pumps is used to compress the gas, and later the gas is allowed to expand those cooling the environment. So the key word here is still the Joule thompson effect. Nothing, nothing crazy, nothing quantum yet. Finally, when we complete our dilution refrigerator by adding cold and mixing chamber flange together with the dilution units, we have to add and mix two isotopes of helium. We have to add helium-3 and helium-4 mixture with this optimal ratio of 1 to 5 to the system. When that happens, next important point to pay attention to is reaching the temperature point of the phase separation. At the temperature below 2 Kelvin, we, we have actually already a superfluid helium-4, so it undergoes the phase transition. Further, when we get to 0.87 Kelvin, we have a phase separation in terms of the mixture. So we have a helium-3 rich phase. Here is the concentration of helium-3. And on the other side, we have helium-3 poor phase. But the important feature is that even at the temperatures close to zero, there is still a finite concentration of helium-3 which likes to stay inside the mixture at the equilibrium. And this is exactly what we will utilize in order to achieve further down cooling. Let's have a closer look at the dilution unit. Here you can see the same stage as mentioned before. So this is the lowest. This is the mixing chamber stage. This is the cold plate. Here is the heat exchanger between the cold plate and the still level. So at the mixing chamber, at the dilution unit and the mixing chamber level, this is where the phase of Separation region is indicated, and helium-3 rich gas phase is indicated as number three over here. And then we have the helium-4 phase as number seven here. But let me show you a bit the simplified diagram to explain what happens and what do we exactly do with those helium atoms, which like to stay inside the mixture. So at the equilibrium, we have this helium-4 and around 6% of helium-3. And if we now continue to pump or add, add a pump to this, to this loop, we'll force helium-3 atoms out of this mixture. But since at equilibrium, and we have to maintain the 6% concentration, some helium-3 from this pure phase, which is actually floating on top because it's lighter than helium-4, so the helium-3 here will float on top. But basically, the atoms from here, they would like to come, come in here to maintain this 6%. And in order to do so, they have to pay energy. So this mixture, our helium-4, is, is of bosonic nature, actually. And uh, for helium-3, which is fermionic, to jump into this boson pool, they have to pay energy, essentially. How do we utilize it? Well, we have a device which we want to cool down. So we take energy in form of heat in this case, which is needed for helium-3 jump into the pool. And this way we reduce temperature. We take the heat away from the device, we reduce the temperature, and that's the main principle. Uh, and that's how we achieve the goal. We, we need to cool down the device so that the customers can perform their experiments at the millikelvin temperature. So essentially, we are disturbing the equilibrium by forcing helium-3 atoms all the time out and by allowing more helium-3 to come in. But because they have to pay energy, we end up cooling our device. With this, I would like to quickly summarize the first pre-cooling of the illusion fridge happens using pulse tubes. We get to 4K, then we have to add helium mixture, 
pump until the phase separation happens. And then we utilize the fact that there's always 6% of helium-3, which likes to stay inside the mixture. And we just constantly disturb the atoms and make them flow by ultimately cooling our device. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I would like to remind you to please check Blue Force website. Please check our open positions if you're interested and feel free to submit an open application. This, we move to our Q&A session. Vera joins me. We are happy to answer any questions, comments, anything which got your attention, anything you might want to clarify. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for giving us insight in how to get to such low temperatures, 10 millikelvin. There are, there are several questions coming in, and I will ask them rapidly and looking forward to your answers. At the very last slide, or, or quite recent, uh, Sharma asks, is helium-4 in a superfluid phase at this temperature? It looks like it's from the phase diagram. Can you, do you know what I refer to? It was quite at the end. Yes. Is helium-4 in a superfluid phase at this temperature? Right. So here you can see the temperature range. So all this region refers to the superfluid helium-4 as well as fermi-liquid helium-3, which means it's superfluid at this point as well. Then uh, Christian comments, the stuff about cooling is amazing. Thanks for this talk. Laurens from Amsterdam asks, down to which temperature uh, can helium maximum be cooled? And this is interesting because it depends on the pressure. Exactly. It depends on the pressure that pumps create. And uh, of course, uh, technically, we, we, we could continue cooling even below 10 millikelvin, and in practice, blue force fridges 7 millikelvin, and it's possible to go down even lower, not with this system, but there are additional methods used, and of course, theoretically, you can always go lower, but practically, you're limited by the size and the surfaces of your system, so um, you, you could go even lower. You, you can even get to micro kelvin. That is amazing. So we know helium-4, 4, 4 Kelvin, and then you can pump on it. You can get to 1 Kelvin. And now with the helium-3, helium-4 mixture in a dilution refrigerator, sub-10 millikelvin. Uh, Shoria Agrawal from US asks, what makes your technologies different from other dilution refrigerator companies? And which innovations are coming up in the field? That's a very good question. Thank you. Vera, would you like to take that one? I guess the, the best thing that we have is our dilution unit, which is basically our secret sauce. So our dilution unit is unique and it works extremely well. Alina was saying we get typically below 10 millikelvin. Our thermometers, we don't calibrate them below 7 millikelvin, so they're often saying out of range. So that's nice to know. And the other thing is also the way we have built our fridges. They're very modular, very easy to put together and to basically to work with. So it's very easy to work with them. We have a very good system for starting and stopping the system. So it's software controlled. And you don't have to do very much except push a button and start the cool down. So once you've got your experiment there, close your cans and start the button. That's great. And now Atsushi is curious, what is the advantage of your technologies against adiabatic demagnetization refrigerators? Right. A very good question. Adiabatic demagnetization actually allows you to get to the micro Kelvin indeed. But that's not something we do because most of the customers, most of the community, let's say, demand, <laughs> demand milli Kelvin. So there's not really an advantage. I would say it's like an additional stage to the fridge. It would be a different, different product, different temperature range. It's also a different research. So it depends on your research needs and what you're what you're aiming to do. So for a lot of the stuff that happens with quantum computing, the 10 millikelvin range is, is quite adequate. But if you want to do some very pure research, you might need that extra cooling down to sub-micron temperatures and the adiabatic stuff is going to work much better. But again, that's going to be, depend on your application. The devices that are measured in these are very small. Taha Ruaba from Algeria asks, what are the actual spatial dimensions of your SD and LD cooling systems? Yes, very nice questions, because I find it often that our customers don't uh, necessarily have a good understanding of the dimensions. Uh, inside the cryostat, it's, well, the SD systems, they're small, but they are still reaching um, over a meter in height. So that's not a meter on the frame. The frame sits at around two and a half meters. 
somewhere between 2.2 and 2.5 metres. The uh, NSD system weighs around 100 kilos and LD system around 150, 180 kilos. This is just the cryostat, mind you, just the cylinder part. And an XLD can be upwards of the 200 kilos. And then if you add mass to it, of course, it's going to get heavier. Um, right. So I, I just switched to this slide to show that, yeah, Vera was mentioning. So the cryostat also has a frame. It holds on to that one is at least more than two meters. Yeah, they're typically two and a half meters. So yeah. yeah. And then inside the cryostat, it's how many millimeters? Almost 300 millimeters, I believe we it's have. About, yeah, about 30 centimeters yes. for an LD system at the base. And for an XLD, it's about 50 centimeters. Yeah. yeah, there are some people here who have a big enough house and they wonder how much does it cost? Is that something you can reveal? It's well, probably the price of their just... house, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's think about how much it's going to cost you to run it. <laughs> so it's probably going to cost you as much to run it as your whole house costs in a year. So on a daily basis. So you have to consider the amount of energy that you need to use for a system like this. So they really are more a research device than something that you can have in your basement. Um, Good and point. plus you need a very tall basement. <laughs> then about the cooling power, how much heat is extracted typically in milliwatts? Vinit Mukim asks, what is the power? requirement and how much time does it take to reach to millikelvin all the way from room temperature right so in terms of time uh sd the smallest one takes less than 12 hours mm -hmm. to fully cool down to 30 even 20 millikelvin and then the ld take 24 hours uh, to cool down below 10 millikelvin a very standard ld yes actually a little bit less, about two hours okay 20, 22 yeah. hours to get below to base or something like that and an xld will take about 24 to 26 hours but if you add stuff to it the more stuff you add the longer it'll take to cool down but uh, typically the main the bulk of the cooling happens in the first sort of 16 to 18 hours where we have to cool to about four kelvin and after that the process is very quick we have two separate mechanisms that's called pulse pre cooling and that takes things down to around two one to two kelvin and then condensing of the actual mixture which takes it down to the millikelvin stages and each of those stages take about two hours in total Thank you very much. Louis SX asks, why are you using helium cons and pros? I think there is simply no alternative. It's correct. Uh, in order uh, to achieve those low millikelvin temperatures, we actually use this like unique feature that there's this 6% of helium-3, which likes to stay inside the helium-4. And it's crucial because if there wouldn't be this poor phase, um, we wouldn't be able to force them in and out and achieve the cooling. It's a very unique uh, quantum nature of these two isotopes of helium-3 and 4 we exploit. Yeah. Great point. More questions about the physics. Bacau, Dayum, Senegal and France. The mixture of helium-3, helium-4 is bosonic. Is that what you said and why is that the case? Oh, well, that's just the quantum nature. When the helium-3 becomes a superfluid, it's a Fermi liquid. And the helium-4, when it undergoes the superfluid transition, becomes bosonic liquid. That's how it is. Electrons are fermions. That's their nature. So same with the helium-3 and 4. It's their quantum nature. And then can you explain what this forbidden region is actually like? Can we understand it to be? Forbidden region, well, physically, you cannot force a matter to be in that state under those conditions. So it's something which does, it's like, if you think about the phase transitions, right? The one we are familiar with as freezing water, when it goes uh, from liquid to crystalline phase, and uh, there's nothing forbidden about it. But having a helium-3, helium-4 mixture, let me get back to the to the actual plot. Yeah, this plot refers to the helium-3 concentration and the temperature range. So we cannot have 50% of helium-3 at temperatures as low as 0.2, let's say, Kelvin. It just doesn't sit inside there. It would not be an equilibrium. So we are talking here about... Um, about the system being in, in, in equilibrium, right? So, of course, we can pump and force, try to force more atoms to, uh, for example, enter uh, helium-4. But if we allow uh, the system to reach equilibrium, there will be only this, let's say, 6.4, um, around 6% left. It's a Very clear. forbidden phase because it doesn't exist in nature. In the then we will try to do three more questions within one minute. Could you please email us some good papers to learn more about the final stages of the cooling process? Everyone is very eager to learn more. Next question.
what can bring about instabilities in cooling cycles such that you struggle to reach the base temperature of these systems? Yes, and then next question, what is the current limiting factor that prevents further miniaturization of your systems? So first, any instabilities, any struggles, and then how to get it smaller? I guess instabilities happen if we have hot spots. If the system isn't properly sealed, if there are loose components, then we're going to have hot spots and then we can't get the system to cool down properly. So it has to all be nice and tight. We can't have loose screws, loose any loose wires floating around. You know, if you if you leave something there, it'll It'll just vibrate forever and become a warm source, so to speak. The same with the shields. If the shields aren't properly tightened and things like that. So the shields act as an insulating layer between the next temperature zone. So you can think of a shield around still flange. Keeps everything inside there under the one Kelvin sort of range. And inside the 4K range, 4K. So so everything so needs to be very good. Then now yes. the quantum computing field is blooming. How do you see the demand for dilution refrigerators? Do you see a difference compared to 10 years ago? Yes, so we see a big difference and a big growth in quantum computing community and demand from that community, definitely. <laughs> Great. Now you said you have 40 dilution refrigerators to test. Actually, very low temperatures at your place. And you also said you have the finished sauna there. So it is a contrasting place, warm <laughs> for the employees and very cold for the science and technology. Question that guides us towards IBM, a very advanced question from Juliana from Italy. IBM is partnering with Blue Force for the new cryogenic platform, KIDE. As announced, it will be using this platform for its forthcoming IBM Quantum System 2 series of machines. What are the major outcomes of this technological leap in the cryogenic platform? Do they show less error-prone qubits, or does the modular structure allow for an enhanced scalability of the quantum processor? You might comment on, and uh, Daniela will come soon from IBM. If you have comments, you're yes. welcome. Absolutely. So just a quick comment. Yeah, our new system, Kile, was recently announced, and it's mostly about the scalability. So it allows to have over a thousand or close to close to thousand qubits. So yes, it's a system which allows to have a lot of wiring and uh, more qubits. Thank you so much, both of you, for this great presentation and for answering so many questions from participants. More questions are flowing in, so we will kindly ask them to answer a few more by email. We are very happy with this presentation to hear so much and get such deep insight into getting to sub-10 millikelvin temperatures. And then now it is time to hear more what to do in such a dilution refrigerator with Daniela Bogorin from IBM. Thank you, Thank Blue you. Force, and welcome, IBM. That is wonderful to hear. Thank you so much. And tomorrow we will see a virtual lab tour at MIT where you will see dilution refrigerators again and experiments on superconducting devices. So you will get more insight then and also have the opportunity to ask their scientists about the experiments. Thank you very much. And everyone, see you tomorrow. Keep asking questions and we will be in touch with Daniela to get all of them answered. Thank you and see you soon.